In this video, we're going to talk about weak acids and their Ka values. Previously, I showed this reaction where a weak acid dissociates in water to form its conjugate base and the hydronium ion. And this equilibrium constant is very small, meaning that it favors the reactant side. We can write this reaction more generally for any weak acid, HA, and its conjugate base, A-. And for this specific type of reaction, we can also define a new equilibrium constant, Ka, or the acid dissociation constant. So you might be wondering, why do we need a new equilibrium constant? Well, Coming back to Kc, for this reaction, I can write it as a ratio of my products over my reactants. And one thing about the water appearing in the Kc reaction is that water is also the solvent. So it's really not going to change concentration because there's so many more solvent water molecules than there are water molecules that are actually getting protonated in this equilibrium. So to simplify this equilibrium expression, I can remove water, leaving behind the hydronium ion and the conjugate base over the weak acid concentrations, and that is now called Ka. So characteristic of a weak acid is that Ka is indeed very small, and what that means then is very little product will be generated, so the concentration of hydronium will be very low. Now let's talk about Ka in a more quantitative way. Here's a list of weak acids shown with their Lewis structures and their corresponding Ka values. And even though these acids are all considered weak acids, their Ka values span eight orders of magnitude, here from at the very top, 10 to the minus two, all the way down to the bottom, 10 to the minus 10. The larger the Ka value, the stronger the acid, because that means you form more hydronium ions. Because Ka values can be so vastly different, sometimes it's nice to think about them on a logarithmic scale. So I'd like to introduce a notation where we focus more on the magnitude. The notation P means logarithmic function times minus one. And so if we apply this to Ka, then taking the minus log of Ka is a pKa value. Now the pKa value we can get for all these acids simply by plugging them in here. And we'll see that something to the 10 to the minus two roughly should give us a pKa of about two. And so the pKa is actually 1.96 for this first acid. And again, this eight order is a magnitude. You can simply see that by comparing 1.96 versus 9.2. Now on the pKa scale, stronger acids will have lower pKa. Water can undergo a really interesting reaction called water dissociation or self-ionization. So just like a weak acid and a weak base when dissolved in water can dissociate, so can water. So here we have two molecules of water as a reactant. One is going to act as an acid and the other is going to act as a base. And we're gonna basically do a proton transfer to generate hydronium ion and hydroxide ion. Now this equilibrium constant is extremely small. We can also define a new equilibrium constant called Kw where W stands for water. And this stems from the Kc expression, but again, because water is a solvent, we can take it out of consideration. 
leaving behind just the product of the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion. And at room temperature, this product, which is Kw, has a value of 1 times 10 to the minus 14. In this equilibrium, both the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion are generated at the same time, so they're formed in a 1 to 1 ratio. And if their product is 1 times 10 to the minus 14, then each of these concentrations has to be 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And again, I can use that notation P, where I take the minus log function, and I can define pH as the minus log of the concentration of hydronium ions. And I can also define pOH, which is the minus log of the hydroxide ions, and plug in the same values. And I would get that water solution has a pH of 7, which I believe probably we all heard of um, before in an earlier science class. But also, water has a pOH of 7 because both of these ions are present in a small amount but an equal concentration. Coming back into this Kw expression, I can also take the minus log of both sides. And what I would get is I would get pKw on one side. And each of these concentrations would become pH plus pOH. And the minus log of this value would get 14. So another way of thinking about this relationship is to think about it in terms of the minus log functions, where pKw is equal to pH plus pOH, and that equals 14, also at room temperature. So here's the pH scale, which normally goes from 0 to 14, but we've extended it a little bit further. We start at minus 1 to 15. What's most important is that pH of 7 is the neutral line that divides acidic from basic solutions. And acidic solutions have low pH values below 7, whereas basic solutions have pH values greater than 7. And strong bases have pH values closer to 14, while strong acids have pH values closer to zero. We have this relationship from before where the pH was defined as the minus log of the hydronium concentration. So I can rearrange this equation and solve for the hydronium ion as 10 raised to the minus pH. And so using these values, I can come up with the hydronium ion concentration. And again, one thing to realize is that no matter the pH, there's always some hydronium ions present. But because hydronium ions are acids, then you see that they are higher concentrations when the pH is acidic or less than 7. And when the pH is greater than 7 and we're in the basic regime, then the hydronium ion concentration gets very small. Now we can come back to the Kw equality or the pKw equality. And now we have hydronium ion. We can solve for the hydroxide concentration. And again, if we have pH, we can solve for pOH. And so that brings these last two columns here. And just like before, with hydronium ions, no matter what pH we're at, we'll always have some concentration of hydroxide ions. And the product of hydronium and hydroxide must always be 1 times 10 to the minus 14 at room temperature. And likewise, the pH plus pOH will always equal to 14. Finally, to complete the relationships here, Previously, we defined that pOH is the minus log of the hydroxide ions. And again, I can rearrange to solve for hydroxide concentration as equal to 10 raised 
to the minus POH value. So these equalities on the left basically allow us to interrelate hydronium ion concentration with pH, but also to hydroxide concentration and pOH. Just to present it with a more simpler diagram, in all these solutions, we're going to have present some concentration of hydronium ion and some concentration of hydroxide ion. When these two ions are equal in concentration, that means we have a neutral solution. If we have an acidic solution, that means the hydronium ion concentration wins over the hydroxide. And if we have a basic solution, then the hydroxide concentration wins over the hydronium concentration. So we can think of this first line as concentration, and we can think of this bottom row here in terms of pH. And this is another way for me to show you how these ion concentrations are interrelated also with pH and pOH. So like before, if you want to convert between hydroxide and hydronium ion concentration, you can simply divide into Kw by using this equality here. To interconvert between the concentration of hydronium ions and pH, we can simply use the minus log function. And to go from pH to concentration, we would use minus pH raised to the base of 10. And the same relationship for hydroxide and pOH. Now, once we're in the bottom row, we can also think about the pH and pOH as being constrained and that their sum must equal to pKW, which is 14 at room temperature. Some weak acids actually have two or more ionizable protons that they can dissociate. In this example here, this is carbonic acid, and these two protons highlighted in red can both be dissociated. And the way that works is it's a step process where in the first equilibrium, referred to as Ka1, you can lose one of the protons to generate the conjugate base that has a minus one charge. Then in a second equilibrium referred to as Ka2, you can lose that second proton to generate carbonate. Carbonic acid is a diprotic acid because it's got two acidic protons Something slightly more complicated is phosphoric acid, which is a triprotic acid, because it, these three protons highlighted in red can all be dissociated. And again, this is a stepwise manner where you first lose one in the first equilibrium, referred to as Ka1. Then you lose the second in the second equilibrium, referred to as Ka2. And the last and third proton can be lost in the final equilibrium, Ka3, to generate the phosphate anion. Because as you lose protons, you gain negative charges, and charges are typically considered bad for a molecule, it becomes increasingly difficult to remove those additional protons. In all these polyprotic acids, Ka1 will by far be larger than Ka2, which will also be in turn larger than Ka3. To give you more specific values, here's a list of some polyprotic acids and the different Ka values. So Ka1 in the first column, then Ka2, and then for the triprotic acids, here are Ka3. So we were talking about phosphoric acid, which is shown here. And you can see that Ka1 is 10 to the minus 3. Ka2 is about 10 to the minus 8. And Ka3 is the smallest at 10 to the minus 13. 
So this is really a nice example showing how different these Ka values become because as you remove a proton, it becomes that much harder to remove the second and also the third proton. So each of these Ka values for phosphoric acid basically differs by five orders of magnitude. Polyprotic acids can be tricky because they have so many different Ka equilibrium and sometimes you have to be able to differentiate between them. So I'd like to go over all the different Ka expressions for this triprotic acid H3PO4 and here again is the general equation for an acid dissociation. We have the weak acid HA dissociating into hydronium ion and its conjugate base A minus. And this has an equilibrium constant called Ka. Starting with H3PO4, this is an acid that can dissociate its first proton to generate the anion H2PO4. And this anion is the conjugate base of the neutral triprotic acid. The H2PO4 can also act as a weak acid and undergo another dissociation to form H3O plus and HPO4 2 minus the dianion. And now this dianion is the conjugase partner to the monoanion H2PO4. Now again, we still have that last ionizable proton, so we can undergo a third dissociation in the third Ka equilibrium uh, to finally form PO4 trianion or phosphate anion. Um, which at this point we would stop because there's no more protons to lose. Now for each of these Ka equilibrium, we can write the Ka expressions simply by taking the product concentrations over the reactant. And here the reactants are the acids and in the numerator is where the conjugate base are. So keeping track of Ka1, Ka2, and Ka3, here are the values from the prior table. The tricky part with dealing with polyprotic acids, you can see that the monoanion H2PO4 can actually play dual roles. And it participates in both Ka1 and Ka2. So sometimes it's difficult to pinpoint which equilibrium is actually taking place. And to figure that out, sometimes you just need to think about what role H2PO4 anion is playing. If it's a conjugate base, then it's Ka1, but if it's an acid, it's Ka2. And the same is true for HPO4 dianion. This can be a conjugate base in Ka2, but it acts as an acid in Ka3. Now H3PO4 can only be the acid in Ka1, and the PO4 trianion can only be the conjugate base in Ka3. And lastly, besides keeping track of Ka's, we can also convert these values to the pKa values. And so we have values of 2.14, all the way to 12.37. So we can see more clearly from the pK values that there's really 10 orders of magnitude different uh, between that first acid dissociation constant and the third.